All right, welcome folks to Last Week I Learned. Today's is the newsletter edition, so we're going to be going through five articles from this week. All right, let's dive in. The first one up is called, When Should I Check the Mail? And it's a very innocuous question, but this author goes on what I think is the deepest dive I've ever seen, and I adore it. It's an hour-long article about his statistical modeling of mail and using totally different approaches to figure out when he should go check. And I don't necessarily recommend you read this, but I love that it exists. And I think it's a great example of probably a waste of time, but like allowing your passion to kind of get unleashed on strange questions. And I'd be willing to bet that this proved useful in some unpredictable way. And I think we should all be doing more of these kind of strange investigations of things we find interesting and curious. And I mean, I'm biased here, I think in part because I've kind of asked this question, what should I read? I've spent the last six months tinkering with that. And I have done a similar, you know, deep dive into it. So I think this is close to my heart for that reason. But I found it fascinating. I actually learned a lot about statistics. If you do read it, you can find some really cool stuff in there. But uh, well worth just looking at and and being impressed by this person's dedication. All right, next up, the entrepreneurial state. So I love when people kind of cross-pollinate between fields. And here what we're seeing is someone taking kind of ideas from the business world and applying them to the political world. And this is really about the development of countries in Europe and how war and different political structures influenced it. Very interesting. For those that have read Guns, Arms, and Steel, I assume it's similar. I have not read that book. But I would say, from my reading of it, it's kind of like a bite-sized, Europe-focused Gun, Germs, and Steel. Very interesting, very well done. I don't agree with all of it, but it definitely made me think, and it's worth reading. All right, next up. Optimize for bio cores first, silicon cores second. So... I've been thinking a lot about AI, and I think one of the consistent narratives in AI is that it's just going to take over a bunch of jobs. And I I think, you know, there will be job destruction. We saw that with automation and robotics for manufacturing. We saw that even with the creation of the loom, right? So I don't want to minimize that. But I do want to, I've been looking for ways to understand and analyze AI and where it can be useful. And I think David Hennemeyer Hansen, who is the one of the co-founders of Basecamp, really interesting person. I, I would say I don't agree with him about half the time, but here I do, right? So let me just read the quote because I think he says it better than I can. That's what so many programmers have a difficult time internalizing. They are, in effect, very expensive biological computing cores and the real scarce resource. Silicon computing cores are far more plentiful and their cost keeps going down. So as every year passes, it becomes an even better deal trading compute time for programmer productivity. AI is one way of doing it, but it's also what tools like Ruby on Rails were about since the start. So I think this is a really great point. I think we are very far from general artificial intelligence where we could just say, hey, make me this website and maintain it and keep it cool and do interesting things, right? I think we've gotten to the point where we can say, make me this website. But the the trick here that I don't think it's talked about is it's one thing to make a website. It's another to scale it. It's yet another to maintain it. So I think we are going to need, for at least the foreseeable future, folks who can maintain and handle and direct these systems well. And so what I'm really looking for when it comes to AI tools is tools that make me more productive, not flashy, not crazy, but that help me do things maybe I couldn't before. So one of them that I'm using is a podcast editing tool, right? And I used to painstakingly edit podcasts in GarageBand, and now I just upload it to the cloud. It rips out, you know, all my, I guess, ums and uhs and huge, you know, gaping silences that I leave while I'm thinking. And then it spits out, you know, an updated 
version. And I wasn't paying a podcast editor before. And so, you know, it's not replacing someone's job. It's just saving me a half an hour, which is awesome. And I'm also using a tool called Cursor, which is an AI kind of code editing tool. And it doesn't write my code for me, but it does guess what I'm thinking. And if it got it right, you know, it saves me a couple of seconds of typing. And I think that is a nice improvement as well. So that's really what I'm looking for when it comes to AI tools is what, what tools leverage and improve my abilities rather than like replace me, right? I'm, I'm not really interested in the tools that generate a whole website or are no code, quote unquote. I'm really interested in tools that help me do what I do already a little bit faster. Maybe I'm wrong for that, but that's, that's my takeaway from this article. And I found it really interesting. All right, next up, how to break up Google. So this is from my colleague at Raptive. He's really, really sharp. And I was fascinated by his clear-eyed take on this Department of Justice Google case. I have read a lot about it. And before reading this article, I really struggled to wrap my head around it. It's a really complicated case. Google's a really complicated company. And what I found is after I read this article, it all became much simpler. So Don does a really great job of breaking down both what the case is about and one potential scenario that could come from it. And it's helped me analyze and understand everything else after. So if you're struggling with this case, you're struggling to understand it, I'd highly recommend you start here and then you'll have a base to understand the rest from. All right, finally, good conversations have a lot of doorknobs. So I think a lot about conversation. I I really love trying to get to know people better and I really think hard about good questions and, and what my role is in the conversation. And this handles both of them and gives me really great mental models for how to have better conversations. So first, it talks about two roles, giving and taking. So the giving role is really about, like if you, if you go with a group of friends to a movie and you get out and you ask, what did people think, right? You're, you're giving people the floor. You're giving people questions that are teed up, right? The taking role would, after that movie, come out and say, I hated that, especially X, Y, and Z. And that sparks debate and conversation, right? Very different way of doing it. Very different way of having conversation. It it requires the other person to, right, really engage and go out on a limb. But those are the two roles, giving and taking. And then next up, though, in either role, what you're aiming to do is create conversational doorknobs, right? And to give an example here, let's say you ask someone about their grandparents, right? A a question without a doorknob is how many grandparents do you have, right? There's not a great way to move forward from that. A question with a doorknob is how are your two sets of grandparents similar or different, right? That's a conversation there rather than just the answer to a question. So I found this a really interesting, these are kind of intuitive ideas, but it's nice to name them and I really enjoyed them. All right, before I go, one thing I want to note is I want to hear what articles you are finding interesting, whether you read them or wrote them. And I would love for you to, I think Spotify and the other channels have like a commenting feature. So if you could throw interesting articles in the comments, that would be wonderful. All right, thank you folks.